welcome, welcome. How are all y'all doing out there? David here. We have for this week's Christian stream. Hoping that you're doing all right. Um, got a fun show. Um, we're going to be talking just a little bit uh, with uh, Stephen Monticelli about some of the right ring groups uh, right here in the state of Texas. Um, sour topic but somebody who i'm very happy um is able to join us because they do incredible work um over at their um you know a bunch of different platforms including texas observer um and just a reminder to folks you know if you missed it on tuesday we had uh harvey k on the program and it was a hell of a lot of fun it's always great being able to chat with harvey uh, we talked about his uh in analysis of joe biden um in his first few years as president um, some lessons from FDR, um, a lot of conversations about sort of where the left is at. And it's really nice to be able to talk to somebody like Harvey, who has such a wealth of historical knowledge about the American left. Um, so there's a little bit out there for the in the main show, in the public show. Uh, but if you didn't watch that whole conversation, he stayed on with us for like another 90 minutes, two hours uh, to be talking about everything that was going on. Um, yeah, yeah, pretty much everything that was on his head. I mean, we even talked a little bit of LSU football. Um, so it was a really good time. Um, so if you haven't signed up already, join us up at uh, patreon.com slash left reckoning. And uh, remind folks um, that next week we're going to have uh, Vivek Chibber on the program uh, during the Tuesday show. Um, he has a great book out right now called The Class Matrix, which you all should definitely check out if you haven't read it already. Um, we're going to have him on to talk about that book. Um, the, the concept I'm hoping we'll be able to get him to talk a little bit about this concept, uh, called the labor aristocracy, um, and some of the criticisms from the left about this idea that I think is getting more and more popular online. Um, and then in the post game next week, we're going to have our good friend and comrade Matt Huber on as well, um, to talk a little bit about degrowth and, uh, one of his more recent, um, pieces in Catalyst Magazine with Fred Stafford on socialism and the electrical grid. Um, so something that's super uh, wonderful. Um, it's always great to have uh, Matt on the show. So really looking forward to that. Um, and just reminded folks, um, I think Stephen is here. If he's ready, I might bring him on in a second. Um, great. Um, but just reminded folks, you know, these are a little bit more interactive. So if you have questions, I mean, I'm just going to be talking to Stephen for a bit if you have any questions that are pertinent to what we're talking about we might bring them up on screen um, and then after steven's done if you had any other kind of topics things that are out sort of outside the scope of our conversation i'll get to them then um but without any further ado uh let's bring on our guest uh for this week's griscom stream uh steven Moncelli. how are you doing friend hey i'm doing all right how are you i'm good thank you so much for taking a little bit of time to talk with me today oh, i'm glad to be here well, um, you know, and uh, we had Gus uh, Bova on the program on Tuesday, so we're having a little bit of a Texas Observer uh, celebration on the program. And I just want to remind folks, uh, you should definitely be subscribing uh, to the Texas Observer if you... Oh, man. My audio screwed up. <laughs> oh, no. Are you not hearing me? I Okay. I hear you now. I didn't hear anything you were just saying. I'm just trying to make sure that i don't have the wrong mic but i think i'm good so uh if you said anything important or you asked me a question i mean you're gonna have to ask you to repeat it <laughs> oh, no, no worries friends oh i was just uh, priming the listeners on the texas observer and telling people that they should be subscribing if they aren't already um, oh that's great <laughs> well um well, okay so we're good you can hear me fine uh, you're, you're coming all, all yeah. good okay great great well, you know, Stephen, I mean, uh, I really appreciate you joining me um, for 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 this Griscom stream. You know, these are a little bit more uh, casual, but, you know, I've been following your work for a while and I figured you might be the perfect person to come on and give our listeners because we have listeners sort of all over. A lot of them are here in Texas. Um, but, you know, you do this really important and I'm sure frustrating and horrifying work of looking at the at the right in the state and. I would just be curious if you could give people like your general sense as an observer, um, like the different far right movements and like, I'm not even like, I want to get to like, for example, like the, some of the stuff the GOP is doing now, but I'm talking about like the people who are showing up at, for example, drag shows and doing all these kind of things. I mean, could you give people a, a sense of like how 
deeply embedded those groups are and also like you know where did they they come from because like there's always been that kind of thing here don't get me wrong but it seems like there's been significant mobilization in the past few years right right uh great question thanks for the intro and definitely take dave's recommendation check out the texas observer it's the place that makes most of the work that i do in texas possible um so in terms of you know far right extremist groups in texas and as you said we can uh carve out the gop for now and set that aside um we have probably one of the highest concentrations of hate groups uh in the united states in texas it's either us or california that's you know up at number one spot california is, is so large um that they compete with us on hate as well um but in texas we also have uh, in the past like i think year year and a half time frame have had the highest number of anti-lgbtq mobilizations in the entire country um if i'm wrong about that i guess i haven't been paying attention enough elsewhere but go check out uh, acled that's a great place for um you know aggregating sort of protest and crisis and conflict data and uh, their data has pretty consistently shown that texas is among you know the leader of the pack uh if it's the leader of the pack if not among the leaders and you know the types of groups that we see uh, most often so you've got your sort of religious extremist type groups mm -hmm. um some folks may have heard of the new columbia movement that's one that has been showing up increasingly at um these sorts of events across uh not just north texas where i'm based but um across the entire state and and they're like a hard line third positionist catholic specifically group that um you know shouldn't surprise any of you or any of the listeners if you're familiar with like nick fuentes mm -hmm. or patriot front which is another group that has shown up to a number of these events um not as much um in terms of like numbers as some other groups and not as consistently because they've kind of been on the ropes um in recent months with a number of legal troubles and you know that massive arrest in idaho um but there's a significant sell of them um in in texas in a, in a couple of different areas that do show up i grew up in the town that is right next to where the leader of patriot front started okay. the organization yeah so um texas is a nexus for this stuff and and there's interconnections and overlaps between groups we've seen proud boys show mm -hmm. up uh at the same events as these other groups um you know i'm sure listeners are familiar with them uh we have seen more like outright neo-fascist groups um i believe it's the american nationalist initiative is one that has been showing up recently at a number of events across the state um and then we've also just got outright neo-nazis um and you know there's uh, there was a neo-Nazi conference uh, that I reported on how a group of anti-fascist uh, researchers and, you know, basically um, professional Nazi hunters flew a, a drone over this conference and identified a mm -hmm. number of people who were there. And we also reported on how, you know, the there's like a lawyer, um, some of you may know his name, Jason Lee Van Dyke. He's based in North Texas and he's got connections to both Patriot Front. And apparently he was at that neo-Nazi conference. Um, so you know there's 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 a whole smattering of groups there's ones that i'm um probably not remembering off the top of my head there's more kkk affiliated ones that have made um you know sort of appearances and they're they're more in east texas mm -hmm. um but there's there's a whole nest here and some of them do have interlinkages um uh, oftentimes you would you know just call them maybe fellow travelers so to speak of um hate and they show up somewhat independently but um you know there's suspicion that there may be some you know deeper level coordination across some of these groups um in in the major cities you know places like dallas uh austin san antonio um you know we've had sort of major gr groupings of these um organizations come out and you know sort of try and show out in force uh recently candace burn uh, I think I may have just said her last name wrong, but she works at Truth Out. She did some good reporting on like another one of these congregations of, uh, you know, far right groups at um, a drag show. And as of late, you know, it's basically been drag shows or pride events or anything like that. That has been the um, 
you know, the major draw that brings a lot of these groups together, uh, the major focal point of hate in the state, which happens to also coincide with uh, the Texas GOP's full frontal assault on LGBTQ rights, um, you know, trans trans youth and their parents mm -hmm. and, you know, a whole other number of things, the, the history um, of these, you know, the, of oppression of these groups over time, wanting to basically erase that. Um, you know, one last thing I'll say that kind of maybe will be the segue for us to talk about the GOP later is uh, there was one instance where the Texas GOP officially, you know, tweeted out, uh, this is a drag show that's happening. We don't like mm -hmm. basically go protest it. And who do you think showed up right after that? Literally neo-Nazis. So, um, you know, they didn't want to take any sort of accountability for that or really directly comment on that. But uh, actually I, I, I had, um, you can go and look, they blocked me officially on Twitter after I kind of was trying to hold them to account for this. And they said uh, like great journalism or nice journalism, bro. Um, so, you know, that's the attitude that they give when it comes to like pointing out this open, really vitriolic hate that, um, has occurred all over the state and some, you know, groups that I haven't even mentioned, like there's militia groups, mm -hmm. militia groups will show up sometimes, uh, the true, this is Texas freedom force, which, you know, their main, um, sort of reason for existing the raison d'etre was to protect Confederate monuments um, from protests, you know, several years ago. So it, it's just, you know, well, I mean, it's no, a lot. There's it's a lot a, it's a, going it on. Is, it is a lot. And like, I mean, I just, you know, cause I mean, there's, there, there, there's so much that's happening with this right now. And I think like a, a lot of the stuff around like trans rights, um, is, is getting a lot of coverage as it, as it should. And I mean, like, I'll just say this anecdotally, um, you know, I grew up, you know, I, you know, I'm from Austin, grew up in like the queer community here. Um, you know, I have a lot of family members who are gay and trans and things like that. And like, it's been horrifying to see, cause I remember when I was a kid, what that was like, you know, there was like, you know, for the most part it's acceptance, but you would get like weird people who would maybe say something in public or like some family, they won't let, let their kids play with you or, or whatever. But like in the mid two thousands onward, it seemed like, you know, tremendous strides had been done and then in the past few years it's been really frightening to see these things sort of roll back and what i i'm i'm sort of curious to ask you um and i know this is a tough question to answer but like when it comes to like these far right mobilizations particularly around um against trans rights and drag shows um you know is is it that a lot of these groups were sort of in waiting and then there seems to be maybe a kind of political or social movement that is that they can sort of latch on to or do you think um that this is like attracting a lot of people to join those groups if that makes sense like are, are these groups like showing up to these things or are they sort of organizing you know behind most of the organizing around it so um i think that's the answer is it depends and mm -hmm. there's a mix of things uh it is certainly the case that extremist groups will use events like this as uh, attempts to spread their propaganda and maybe even recruit people. Um, that is definitely the case. Uh, I would say, yes, they're like flies attracted to something. You know, mm -hmm. there's the bright thing that they all can uh, coalesce around. That's also true. But there's also um, a number of groups that aren't like explicitly fascist groups mm -hmm. that emerge they're more like what you might call astroturf groups that have emerged to kind of be the main organization that um sort of announces this event is happening and we want to protest it mm -hmm. and no one really knows exactly who funds them there's a there's like at least two there's like three of these groups now one's like protect texas kids one's called defend our kids texas and that one's affiliated with a blaze media person uh, which is Glenn Beck's media empire for those who don't know what that garbage pit is. And then um, like the third group is like Texas family project or something, you know, these innocuous sounding like three or four letter word groups. Uh, I believe most of them, you know, if you're trying to trace back where they're registered, it's like some random person's house or like maybe even in Delaware. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, they don't have to report their donations or anything. So we don't really know who they are being funded by, but these groups emerged over the past like year and a half, two years. Um, it's not that they have these significant memberships, but um, they sort of put out a rallying cry that then these other extremist groups see is getting news attention, 
it's, it's creating a focal point and a flash point. And so then they show up, um, you know, somewhat opportunistically, but also because they agree mm -hmm. with the rhetoric, they agree with the message, which is, you know, uh, these people are quote unquote groomers and perverts and, you know, just kind of rehashing the 1970s anti-gay shit that, you know, this country already went through once before, at least once before. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm curious um, what you think about like the GOP's role in it. Cause like no doubt about it, they're stoking uh, the flames. I mean, my kind of like theory on is like, well, I mean, one, like a lot of them are like just generally bigoted, but the, the trans rights and gay rights in general, and like, particularly like, Oh, kids are being groomed is a great way for them to attack schools. Right. Because like schools are generally popular. And if you can right. make, it seems like schools have been taken over by these dangerous leftists who are, you know, trying to turn your kids against you and introduce them to all these dangerous ideas. Right. Is what they argue. Right. Then it becomes easier for them to sell, you know, voucher programs or things like that. That's really, you know, insightful. And I think really astute of you to, to draw that connection because it is the case that, you know, at least one of these anti-trans, you know, mobilization groups, Protect Texas Kids, also traffics in, you know, school voucher language. And they also have gone after, you know, what they would call like pornography or like woke critical race theory kind of stuff in schools. And it's it's out of a classic playbook, you know, oh, our children, our children are at risk. Well, you know, it's like you're imposing your views on other people's children. It's really not as much about your children uh specifically mm -hmm. and that is absolutely the case that you know the the idea that kids are being groomed in schools to believe certain things kids are being groomed at these you know pride events and drag shows yada 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 that's what they say and it is the case that there is a, an interlinkage here where you know a lot of this stuff kind of gets wrapped up together in bills or you know sort of school board policies that get put forward so you know Another close to home thing for me, the school district where I graduated from, the public school district where I graduated from um, in North Texas, it's uh, Grapevine Colleyville. They were, I, I don't know if others have passed it since, I'd have to go check, but they were the first in Texas to pass an explicitly, you know, sort of anti-gender fluidity policy, mm. which I refer to as don't say trans, um, and a number of other really intense things. Um and this was already after the Texas GOP had, you know, passed a piece of legislation around um, critical race theory, so-called critical race theory in schools. And so, yeah, there, there was this coordinated, at some level, deeply coordinated effort where, you know, a lot of money gets flooded into various school districts, a lot of them primarily in North Tarrant, uh, in Tarrant County in North Texas or in Houston, mm -hmm. but not exclusively. And there's reasons why those areas would be targeted. They're kind of the big enchiladas of conservative votes that if they went too far in one, the opposite direction, the whole state would radically change in terms of its governance, how radically it would change. That's a different conversation. But, um, you know, that's all to say that, yes, like I view the anti-trans, anti-LGBTQ and the critical race theory hubbub, all that stuff as interlinked as a part of the mm -hmm. sort of a deeper strategy to create a new sort of set of culture war issues in areas where the GOP had been losing mm -hmm. steadily influence over time for a number of reasons. And, you know, one of the easiest things that they can pinpoint it all on is like the school board races where, you mm -hmm. know, they highly politicize these technically nonpartisan races. They flooded in a ton of money through various PACs and other avenues of doing this. And um, the effect has been to, you know, basically create so much crisis around schools, public schools in Texas, that like people who support public schools are getting really tired of it and they're concerned and like, you know, parents of kids that are LGBTQ are very terrified. Um, and people who, you know, maybe had been on the fence about staying in Texas and maybe they want to leave now. And then you've got, on the other hand, you know, like people who are unhappy with the schools because they think they're these indoctrination camps mm -hmm. and they would gladly either like, you know, basically do one of two things, make them de facto like Christian nationalist schools by virtue of whatever the state legislature passes or these, you know, school board takeovers. And if they can't do that, 
then they want to destroy them and they want to rip them apart so that, you know, suburban primarily parents can send their kids to, you know, more conservative private schools because like the reality is rural Texas doesn't have private schools. Yeah. Like they have Friday night lights basically like, and the public schools like serve as one of the main unifying forces for like a very spread out sort of, you know, community of people that otherwise don't have a ton of infrastructure and you know so you can't really go after public schools and that actually may be like without there being political consequences and that may be the thing that saves us from having a school voucher bill go through this year is that republicans in the house who will align with democrats to prevent you know these really important institutions from being ripped apart for the sake of you know creating a, a whole new profit <laughs> center for certain people <laughs> no, that's creating this whole new point, industry seriously. that can donate they can yeah. donate to politics too like it creates this whole thing um that really would only you know benefit a pretty small oh, yeah no people. like a normal person is not going to be able to afford the private school tuitions with what even the the vouchers that they proposed would have done right it, you know um no and it's like i think it's like a, like what you're talking about about schools is really important too like i remember um this maybe was a few weeks ago but um one of these house bills about trying to allow uh chaplains and, and religious um figures to basically serve as school counselors um uh, right and it's like we need more school counselors um you know in the state of texas schools are underfunded um a lot of poor schools are underfunded and it was really interesting just talking about how tired i think a lot of educators are and like education advocates are is uh, one of the teachers went up there and she said that like at this point um with what y'all have done like i've just i'm not even going to fight y'all on a long prayer in the classroom right you can have that but like we cannot have chaplains instead of like school guidance counselors right and it's just one of those things where like you think you know normally a, a teacher would say like no to the the prayer and all that kind of thing but it's just sort of like we'll give you this if you can just please let us function and operate our school in some semblance of a normal fashion right right I mean, one of the strategies that i think is really being played out here is just like attrition just wearing people down throwing everything possibly that could be thrown at these communities that like previously otherwise would have been considered like sleepy places where the most contentious thing on the school board would be you know some very like like really specific budget thing you mm -hmm. know that like the busy bodies are really worked up about like it may be for good reason um like or the bus routes or something not this that we're dealing with <laughs> um well i i have we have a question um from our, our good friend uh marcos here who's because you've covered a lot of these kind of you know tense events and uh marcus just so what i want to ask somebody who's been in the presence of these like if you have any suggestions in terms of like you know being safe and smart um there so marcus says suggestions on what to do if we see a far right group intimidating the public Growing up, I remember hearing Holocaust survivors tell me to never allow fascists to organize or march in public. And just in your experience, right. seeing some of these things and seeing how they can get really dangerous. Um, if you had any advice, maybe just somebody who's seeing something like this or might want to organize something around this. Yeah. Well, um, by the time you see a fascist group in your community doing this, if you don't have an organization of people, whether it's mm. loosely affiliated or an actual organization that responds to this kind of stuff, um, I wouldn't do anything personally. Like, don't, it's not worth putting yourself as an individual, like by yourself yeah. at risk like that. So my point would be that you need to organize now if you mm -hmm. haven't already been organized and have a response system where if there is a group like this, or you, you know, see some sort of indication that one of these groups is going to come to town, you have a larger coalition of people and talk to as many people as you can. Like, you would be surprised, you know, that there would be uh, religious groups and others, ministers or people who are opposed to, you know, Christian nationalism or white supremacy who mm -hmm. would be willing to sort of show up in coalition to outnumber them. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, certainly am not going to go on, you know, a podcast or whatever and be like, go beat people up in the street because you're going to get yourself in trouble. Mm -hmm. It's illegal. And, you know, self-defense is one thing, but seeking trouble is another. Um but what I would say is that what is very powerful statement is for a community to come together and reject something mm -hmm. vocally and say, we outnumber you. 
-hmm. and we are together here and we keep each other safe. Um, I don't think you should really rely on the you know, police to necessarily prevent this violence from happening if it is going to happen. Um, because, you know, that's just not how law enforcement works. <laughs> like, no, unfortunately, um, no. Yeah. And, but you, what you can do is you can take precautions to keep yourself safe. Um, you know, maybe think about how you can dress appropriately to keep yourself safe, to, you know, minimize potential harm to you. If you're concerned about being doxxed, mm -hmm. you know, take precautions there when, when it comes to your identity. Um, but first and foremost is solidarity and mm -hmm. working together. So like, you know, unless you like are somehow Superman or something, you're not going to do a lot by yourself. And mm -hmm. I don't think it would be wise to try. Um, so, you know, keeping eyes and ears open and organizing and responding um, with a large group of people, a coalition of people, ideally, is what I would recommend. No, I, th I think that's great advice. Um, yeah, I think it's really important to be smart um, in order to be safe because there are a lot of these groups that are, that are just 100% out there um with the intention to potentially harm people so you don't want to just offer yourself up to that oh and you know uh something i didn't mention would be try to keep it joyful you know mm -hmm. uh, mocking people you don't have to be so self-serious all the time uh the best responses i've seen there's like a an event at hamburger mary's in houston um where uh Nazis and other fascists and stuff showed up and they were across the street and there's a huge group of people with flags and umbrellas and megaphones and music and they were making fun of the people that mm -hmm. were there. Um, humor is a good weapon when it is one of the only ones that you can use. Well, um, I wanted to ask you, uh, a lot of our audience and you know people spend a lot of time online have a good sense of this but i'm i'm curious as somebody who sort of sees these things on the street level what's the role here of some of these less traditional like right wing media outlets um and sort of stoking this stuff because um i know that with the shooting recently uh, there's been like connections with somebody like a tim pool um and you know some of these other figures i'm curious if you think that sometimes uh those things may be overstated or if you think that there probably is more of a pipeline that people might be recognizing between some of these right-wing online figures and these groups you know it's difficult to say exactly what the proximate cause of something like this mm -hmm. is and draw a straight line from like this youtube video or this person's stream or you know yada yada but i mean what what i can say is that Anybody who's paying attention would understand there's like more of an ambiance that is created mm. by this media ecosystem, which ratchets up paranoia and tension and fear and anger and rage of a subset of people directed at certain communities. Um, so it takes an, a certain ambiance <laughs> to create a sense of permissiveness around mm. some of this stuff. Um, some people who end up doing some of these things, you know, individual cases, we have to examine them. And I would hate to paint too broad of yeah. a brush. But I mean, like on the ground, these groups, when you see them on the ground at these events, now that's a little different than mm -hmm. like a dude in a beanie sitting in his fucking room yeah. talking out of his ass. Not great, but it's different whenever you're si talking about people who are like showing up and kind of getting the right angles and and like playing sort of an active role in um, a movement or a protest against this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, what they can often do is they minimize the presence of neo-Nazis, which creates an ambiance of permissiveness for them to continue to show up. Um, and it also helps, you know, make them seem less radical than they are. And then there's, you know, the sort of infiltration and then selective editing project Veritas type stuff, which mm -hmm. feeds directly back into the targeting of specific events and specific locations. Um, and then, I mean, sometimes you have people who just like straight up participate. One time I saw, I don't know if anybody will be familiar with, and I'm, if you are, I'm sorry, Savannah <laughs> Hernandez. Um, she uh, does some stuff. She's like been on InfoWars and does some mm -hmm. blaze stuff and yada, yada. She's kind of like a, you know, third fourth tier person but she's in the dallas area 
and uh, or is in Texas and often comes to this area. And the first time I ever encountered her was at a very small um, little gathering of White Lives Matter people who it turns out one of the attendees was just a fucking Patriot Front guy. Mm -hmm. And we connected that linkage much later on. But what she did, and this will be an illustrative example of like what this stuff can really look like on the ground. She would go around and try to talk to people without really revealing who she was or what she was trying to do to try to get some sort of, you know, kind of gotcha real, you know, make people look stupid. And then um, partway through, she like literally grabbed a megaphone, megaphone and started speaking in support of the white lives matter people's right to be there and yada yada and mm. how BLM is bad and all this stuff and Antifa this and it became, you know, no longer media really or journalism, but more of like just straight up activism. Mm -hmm. um, and people are allowed to do that, but you should just see it for what it is. And so in instances like that, I mean, it becomes a lot more of a an active role <laughs> where I think, you know, there is like some direct responsibility or accountability um, to be you know laid at their feet. Um, whereas the connections with some of these other things are less direct, but they still ultimately contribute to this environment um, and this sort of like constant din that, you know, pushes people towards wanting to sort of take action in this way, in this really dangerous way. I mean, generally, nobody starts getting really worked up about trans people, quote unquote, grooming children without somebody prodding them along the line to start thinking that way. Right. That's like a that's something that is created by by these things. So no, I mean, I, I appreciate like your point, because I think there could be a tendency, particularly on people who maybe are like left wing digital media side or people who consume a lot of that to like see it almost solely as reflections of um one group or the other um like one group sort of spurning and, and and creating these these conditions which they play a big role in it but like yeah there's a big difference between the folks who are on the ground doing that organizing and it's important to be able to recognize both um i think you're you're good if you you, you dipped out for a second um oh yeah i'm, I'm here it, it is just kind of cut out for a second yeah, yeah. but we're back no 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 worries um well i just wanted to you know, ask you um, too. I mean, like we, we sort of alluded to it a little bit before, but with some of these more like far right groups, I mean, um, how would you characterize the relation, if any, to some members of the Texas GOP? I mean, obviously, Texas is a big state, a lot of different politicians and groups, but, um, you know, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, just in general, like, is, is, is there more connection than there might have been maybe 10, 15 years ago? Is it still very much? you know, arm's length away. Um, you know, there's a lot of different subjects that these groups are sort of organizing and showing up around. Um, but I'd be curious about that. And also like, you know, we're coming up to the end of the ledge and there's a lot of really nasty bills and things out there. And if there's anyone that you think is, is important to sort of highlight to the audience to keep their eye on to appreciate that as well. Um, yeah. So I, I do think that there's a, a number of examples of pretty like, handshake mm -hmm. distance relationships not even like you know arm's length but just really just embraced so one guy uh who you may have seen in the news uh, brian slayton who is no yeah. longer a state rep and the reason for that is really really rich um he kind of first came on my radar not just because of his hateful anti-lgbtq bills and also that wacky ass bill where he was trying to basically you know subsidize people having 10 kids but very Victor Orban kind of thing to do. But um, I I started getting a little concerned about this particular guy because he had um, he had been in photos with a member of This Is Texas Freedom Force, mm. one of the extremist militia groups, who literally was on caught on camera like threatening people outside of a drag show, like really vitriolic, very gross stuff. Um, and then. You know, I found out later through the social media posts of one of the other groups, Protect Texas Kids, that was like, you know, the sort of rallying cry group that drew that guy who made those threats out to one of those drag shows. Um, they had like met with Brian Slayton to discuss like, you know, policy and stuff at some point, I guess. Um, and they had posted videos about it, like, oh, we're going to see Brian Slayton. And so, you know, another example, um, the the brother of the the young woman who founded protect texas kids um 
has said some really hateful shit on the internet and mm -hmm. uh he got hired by tony tinderholt who is you know a state rep um you know we've had examples of don huffines he had a, employed one of his people on his campaign that was a member of the groipers um and had spoken at like the nick fuentes conference in the past so you know there's just like so many connections really when you start yeah. to like scratch at the surface um and it is also concerning because you know there's a decent number of like these younger you know like very youngest millennials or some of the older gen z people who are super fashy mm -hmm. and are working in state ledge or you know they had come up through some of these like various pipelines for you know creating the next generation of conservative youth so um uh quite a bit and um you know there's also interlinkages in terms of like donors and you know this one donor monty bennett has given a bunch of money to anti-trans politicians and i just wrote a story with the texas observer co-authored with kid o'connell uh about how this guy had been emailing with an splc designated hate group um back in 2019 or he hadn't been emailing with them he his email chain with a children's medical center hospital that had a gender affirming care clinic in dallas he had basically been sending them veiled legal threats and demanded all the money that his company had ever donated to them if they didn't shut down that particular clinic and this happened you know months before it ended up actually shutting down um after a bunch of public pressure from gop politicians uh who he had all this guy this donor had also donated a bunch of money to hmm. and incidentally he funds a, a newspaper that has you know given a lot of positive coverage and page space to that group protect texas kids and like minimizes the presence of some of these hate groups whenever they cover these events so yeah there's a yeah there's a pretty deep yeah. set of networks and connections and you know um uh, you know, we only know what we know. And uh, what I can say is based on what we do know, um, there's a lot of money and, you know, energy behind some of this that you all are seeing through the news. And like there's I think the, like the, the really scary thing about Texas politics right now is like not just that the right wing is in control, but like because it's such a stranglehold. It's like Huffines, right? It was like a wild character, right? Super right wing, you know, Abbott's, you know, they're able to smack them around. But then like Abbott as governor has like picked up a lot of policies and framings from this like far right. So like the thing that's really scary about the Texas GOP right now is even when some of these more outside characters don't like win the office per, per se, like the people who are elected, like that's the group that's scary. Like that's the group that's threatening to their position, right? So mm -hmm. their, their willingness to sort of be open and to mirror and to like these more fringe, more far right groups has only been accelerating in the, in the past few years, frankly. It hasn't been exclusive. There's a bit of a civil war within the Geo Texas mm -hmm. GOP that's boiled over quite a bit in the past couple of years because of this exact phenomenon you're describing and then in terms of like you know what should we be looking for legislature wise i'm not as deeply steeped into that mm -hmm. um, stuff as some others are but i know there's um there's a you know bill that's i don't think it's been passed yet about trying to ban drag uh kids at drag shows basically mm -hmm. which is written so broadly that it could potentially criminalize a lot of other stuff um which perhaps may be the intention um and uh would effectively kind of push drag performers and drag queens out of public life um to a great extent i mean that um, one if i sorry like like if i remember that correctly like it, it it's so broad that like it could like ban like shakespeare right plays where like you know yeah, <laughs> yeah. i mean it's, you know yeah. and it's it, yeah and it's like oh are you going to consider like someone's butt some touching someone's crotch to be sexually you know ex charged and if so does that mean that someone can't sit on someone's lap like mm -hmm. without it being somehow like sexual um so there's there's so many you know things that are just that one bill there's a bunch of shit that can, they're gonna try to hammer through mm -hmm. um i don't know if the you know voucher thing will get through fingers crossed there's another crazy thing um there's a bill that was trying to pass uh the provision to basically allow like vigilantes to be deputized to like you know look around for illegal aliens and as they would say it and um 
I, you know, I, I know that the initial bill got like defeated, but then there's been this attempt to add that bill or like the chunk, the main chunk of it as an amendment to some other border related bill, which, you yeah. know, there's just a lot of not great stuff that's going on. There's frankly too many things for me to even really recite. Um, yeah. so, <laughs> that was uh, bad asking the question. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 you know, the only saving grace is that we are very much at the, you know, towards the end of this session. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily guarantee things, though, because Governor Abbott, as he's done in the past, and Dan Patrick could um, call special sessions um, mm -hmm. until, you know, they could keep continuing to try to call a special session. And, you know, I don't I'm not the kind of guy that's going to be like, you got to hand it to him. But um, Dade Phelan, the Speaker yeah. of the House, you know, he's been bad. It seems like he's been batting some things down and has been working with a coalition of. I don't, you know, less extreme Republicans to, um, you know, prevent some of these things from going forward. But there is also increasingly ratcheting up pressure from the right wing, like Dan Patrick going after Dade Phelan um, mm -hmm. to try and press him into, you know, uh, basically conceding his position and going along with their agenda. Well, they're um, calling him. How California. long that can happen? I don't know. Or they call him California Dade now, which has been pretty funny. Like the guys, for people who don't know, like, dude's like not from California, has never been there. Um, they just do it because he like likes surfing, like, apparently. <laughs> and then they put God, that was the fucking weirdest day, super normal fucking day in Texas legislature for like the Speaker of the House to post a shirtless photo of himself with like a surfboard and like I he's like yeah we're almost done or like can't wait to go surfing and then for Dan Patrick, the Lieutenant Governor to post a shitty, a really poorly done shitty Photoshop of his head, like on a surfer and then calling him California day. Like we live in Weird clown nice. world down and, here. Like, and, but like <laughs> it, it clown world, not like, you know, funny little guy clown, like the one that wants to drag you into the sewer and murder. Yeah, you. That's clown. probably the way, the way to frame it. Um, Steven, uh, really, really appreciate you taking, uh, some time uh, to chat with me today. would love to do it again sometime soon. I mean, hopefully, uh, you know, we could talk about some, some big victories. I mean, like, I will just say like, actually, if you don't mind, if we ended on an optimistic note, because like, um, things are bad. Right. Um, but like, I do think it's important to like, one thing that gives me a lot of inspiration, both like in contemporary Texas, but like in like the history of the state, it's like there's a lot of awful stuff that happens. But like never forget for a moment that there are so many people who are out there like pushing back and fighting back. And like sometimes you lose, but like never think that you're like alone. And I'm just curious if you had anything, you know, on that on that level you might want to share with the audience. Yeah. I mean, you know, a bunch of high school students walked yeah. out of their school classes today in demand of uh, gun control of one form or another, basically in response to the mass shooting in Allen, Texas, which if you haven't heard about it, it was really horrific. And it was perpetrated by an, a straight up neo-Nazi. Mm -hmm. You know, the exact motive is still being hashed out, but the guy was a neo-Nazi. So um, pretty, you know, sad on the one hand, but I think helps illustrate that there are a lot of people who do want things to be better. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I hate to kind of do the cliche, but it seems like the kids are mostly all right. No, the kids seem good. No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, yeah, it just, I don't know. It just, I think it's really important never to feel like you're alone. There's a lot of people out there doing incredible work. Um, you're doing, oh, yeah. Work. All of these, all of these awful bills have been massively protested Yeah, um, inside and outside of the Capitol. Uh, you know, it's always a significant, difference like the ratio of people who are in solidarity and opposition to this compared to the sickos that want to shove this down everybody's throats so you know do not fall into that bullshit knee jerk of like oh let te texas you know secede because there's yeah. just too many decent people here there really are yeah yeah exactly um, well, Stephen, again, really appreciate uh, you coming on. People should definitely be reading Stephen's work in the Texas Observer, amongst many other places. And subscribe and also congrats on uh, saving the, the magazine. I mean, that was uh, such a beautiful story that meant a lot to to a lot of us out there. So thank you for that as well. Hey, we're we're still. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, we still we still need support. We're a nonprofit. Oh, definitely so, so. Uh, you know, <laughs> smash it, that like and subscribe button. Um, and also, I'll just do my quick, quick other self promo. 
uh, Protean yeah. Magazine. We're about to publish the fourth issue of this awesome leftist literary magazine that I publish with a bunch of awesome people. Um, go read our shit online. It's free if you've never read it. And uh, check out, you know, if you haven't ordered one, if you have pre-ordered one, awesome. If you haven't, um, it'll be out soon. So. Well, hell yeah. I'll get on that too. Um, well, again, Stephen, thank you so much, brother. Um, hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Uh, that was um, Stephen Monticelli, a really, really great uh, writer and reporter and really thankful for all of his work. Um, definitely subscribe to Protean and, and the Texas Observer if you're able to. Um, I can stick around you all for a, a little bit of, of questions and, and things of that nature. Um, so if you have anything you want to talk about, I'm down to talk about, you know, whatever topics are on people's mind. And no, this has been a pretty Texas centric um week on left reckoning but i'm very happy to be covering uh, the state because there's a lot of important and fucked up things and sometimes hopefully good things are happening here um so i have a couple stories maybe i can get to but if people have questions i'm down to chat um about things reminding folks too we're gonna have vivek chibber on next week to talk about his book the class matrix uh, we're gonna have matt huber on again in the post game for patreons patreon.com slash left reckoning so a lot of cool things coming up in the next uh few days for us Oh, but yeah, let's get to uh, some of these chat questions and appreciate these super chats. We got a chat from Joe Snuffy who says, uh, got Nazis up in Rhode Island and they tried disrupting DSA events and got run off by the local community, including street gangs. Uh, hope the same happens to yours. I mean, like, you know, th there's been a lot of people who have been organized and mobilizing here and, and should give you a lot of hope for the future. Um, man, should put this up when he was on there. Sorry, I missed it. But flag burner says Stephen Moncelli is a Texas legend. Uh, he is very happy to have him on the program. Um, you know, uh, Jason Castillo has a good question here. It's clear the GOP won't support trans rights, but how do we hold Texas Democrats who don't support trans right trans rights like Senator West accountable? I mean, look. This is like the thing that's so frustrating is in this state, not only you have to go up against the Republican Party, but you have a lot of Democrats are pretty weak. I mean, you know, it looks like uh, one of these bills that's trying to we were talking about it during the main show on Tuesday. Uh, one of these bills that's trying to basically strip uh, localities from uh, being able to have police oversight, public police oversight. It looks like. Um, you know, there's a Democrat who is, uh, you know, influential in sort of reviving uh, that bill. So, I mean, like, what can you do? I mean, I think this is is one of those things where primaries are really um, important if you're able to be involved in that. Um, and I think, you know, you have to be able to fight on, on two fronts is that like, you know, the reason that the Democrats um, lose so much is here is because like, yeah, there's all these problems with gerrymandering and, you know, having messed up election systems here and all of that. Um, but it's also because the Democratic Party in Texas is unfortunately very bad. Um, so, you know, I think that you have to be able to start building our own kind of working class movements that can start demanding things because at a certain point, I mean, I think it's worthwhile as an individual, um, you know, to make your disgust known, particularly if you're like a constituent, you know, send letters, do calls, things like that, make it public, make them own those votes. Right. Because, um, you know, they, they, they shouldn't be able to get away with this kind of thing. So that's like the, the quick immediate thing, but long-term it's like, you know, we have to start building up movements that can stand on their own two feet and know that it's just the thing that's frustrating. And I know it's not easy. is like, we have to deal with the, the GOP, but we also have to be prepared um, to deal with the rot that's in the Texas democratic party as uh, in the same way as national. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's frustrating to have to fight on two fronts here, but you know, you don't get to pick the world you're born into. And um, Dozer fan uh, says, uh, here from Twitch, want to support the stream without giving Bezos more money. Thanks for this important discussion. Thank you for, for tuning in. I mean, it's really great. And I love, I mean, I really like doing these streams and it's fun to have guests on and do these more informal conversations because I think you can get to a lot of really interesting places. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll pass these notes along to, to Stephen after, folks. I'm sorry. I, I should have been quicker on the on the dial during the interview. But Tony says, Dave, thanks for having Stephen on. Stephen, thanks for repping and covering uh, DFW with Plum. Um, definitely, we appreciate that very much. Um, 
Major Major wants to um, wanted me. So a story came out on Jacobin. If you watch, I think we talked about this a month ago on Left Reckoning. On I think on a Griscom stream itself. Um, but yeah, Major Major, there's a piece in Jacobin that sort of is outlining uh, you know particular aspect of this. But they're trying to reshuffle the courts here, and effectively create a state business court. So basically, if you're uh, you know if if you're a court and you have to deal. Um, there, there's two different versions that they're trying to deal with, right? One is anything that the state is involved in, right? Um, being suing the state or the state suing other organizations to basically have that be set up on a state level, um, which, you know, really makes it more difficult, um, to sue the state for all the awful things that they're, they're doing, um, because the court, um, would be one that would be more loyal to like the GOP and the state government, right? So that's a problem. The other is that they're trying to build, create a, what is called a bit like a business court, right? Um, so anything I think over $1 million, um, would be going to this court, um, that I believe, um, I'd, I could be, I, I would, I need, I'm, I might be getting these two mixed up because, um, one of them, it will be appointed in the same way that a lot of the different uh, offices of, of of the executive branch are set up in Texas, where it's a kind of rotating board so that the governor would be um, selecting judges to go on it every couple of years. Um, but basically, this business court would be one that would be loyal to, um, you know, in the current way that this is set up, Greg Abbott in, in particular, right? Um, which would mean that um, these would be judges who would be very, very happy. Um, you know, to look the other way as oil companies and companies like Musk's companies continue to ravage and, and, and harm the state. Um, but it also creates a dynamic where basically there's a separate legal and justice system um, for very, very wealthy corporations in the state of Texas. Right. It's a way to get around, um, I don't know, like any kind of basic uh, check on, uh, you know, corporate power. It's something that um, any kind of legal expert, you know, when they, they've been trying to get um, people to testify at the vast majority of organizations that aren't just completely bought out by some industry or another are saying like, there's no real reason, um, why this should be the case. Like the justification that they're putting forward is that, um, it's complicated, <laughs> right? Effectively, they're saying that, oh, we should have judges and, uh, you know, special court system that is specialized in, um, you know, doing corporate level um, suits and, and 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 legal judgments so that they understand. Um, but you know, what does that mean? That that means people who are already loyal loyal um, to um, the to, to to these forces. I mean, it's just one example of so many others uh, of the way that Greg Abbott, um, in particular, is trying to strip away. Um, any part of government in the state of Texas that's not directly under his thumb. And he's done a really good job at, at, at weakening democracy in the state um, and concentrating power around the office of the governor. I always remind people that Texas constitutionally is set up to have a weak governor compared to other states um, where most of the power should be residing within the legislature. And Greg Abbott has effectively um, expanded the powers um, of, of the governor's office in a way that's historic in the state's history. I mean, really dangerous. Um, there's human consequences. Look at things like Operation Lone Star. Um, and the ledge is, for the most part, um, very frightened of him. There's been some breaks even within the Republican Party. Um, but for the most part, you know, Abbott enjoys tremendous loyalty and deference from the state GOP here. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that's really worrying. And like, I think it's important also to remember that in the state of Texas, like Texas used to have a court system, which is where like, if you were trying to, um, you know, if you were like, a, a lawyer and like you were trying to sue a big corporation, maybe on like an, on, on something that had like national importance, you'd be very happy if you could get assigned a Texas court because Texas juries um, and the court system here historically used to lay out down pretty severe penalties and punishments for big corporations. That has changed significantly in my lifetime. Um, and it was a conscious project of the Texas GOP to sort of weaken um, that, that, that legacy and that tradition. Um, you know, everyone knows the story about Greg Abbott, Greg Abbott, um, as people know, um, is, is paralyzed. He gets around in a wheelchair um, and he, you know, was hit by a tree. He sued the tree company and the homeowner for a significant amount of money that he, I th believe he's still getting paid out from. 
And when he got into uh, in, into Texas government, um, he worked very hard in capping the amount of money that people get, could get for non, like in addition to like medical um, costs, right? Limiting the amount of, right? Because, you know, how it said, like, I lost all of this potential in my life. I'm not able to get around without a wheelchair. So his payout was massive. Um, and he sort of capped that, I believe something in, in the neighborhood of a few hundred thousand dollars, right? Uh, which is nothing compared to what he got. So look, it's, it's a, it's a hundred percent of war on, um, I don't know, just basic government, frankly. Um, Dozer fan says, fun fact about this, um, this is Texas Freedom Force, the group Stephen mentioned, they formed as a counter protest to a fake Antifa rally one of their founding members created. Um, yeah. No, it's nasty stuff. Is Abbott a competent DeSantis? Well, we'd have to maybe have a, someone on from Florida um, to look at it. I mean, Abbott is is very competent as as a right wing um, provocateur. He's done. I mean, like he has fundamentally changed the office of governor in the state of Texas. And I have a piece in Jacobin that I wrote when he beat Beto last fall. I'm um, called uh, Greg Abbott is Texas's um, strongest governor. Is the strongest governor in Texas's history. That's bad for working people. That people should check out if you want a real like line by line retelling of all the things that he's done to really shift his his position. Um, the thing about, I mean, I talk about this on the show all the time. The thing is, like, I think Abbott has uh, presidential ambitions. I'm leaning toward him probably not deciding to run in this cycle. Um, you know, I think some people have made an astute point about DeSantis is that DeSantis won't be able to be the governor by the time uh, 2028 comes out. So he'll sort of be on the sidelines. So this is sort of his best chance to build a national profile, which is maybe why he's running now. Abbott, I think, has those same intentions, uh, but he's got a little bit more. He has the potential to be in office longer. Um, so I don't think he has any intention of running. But the thing with Abbott is that, like, as a politician, like he obviously, you know, destroys a uh, destroyed Beto in the most recent governor election um you know he's he's been pretty dominant um in in, in state politics um but like he's gotten pretty weak at his ability to like he controls this state so much um that i don't think he's ready to sort of deal with what like a national media audience would be like for example like outside of fox news like his state of the state right which is like the state of the union where he gives his um you know speech about where the state is the most recent one they did at some um, factory in san marcus i believe a magnet factory and i don't even want to say the name because he just gave them a bunch of free advertising right it's traditionally done um in you know at the capitol he made people he he tried to make people sign an nda he, they confiscated cell phones and they pre-recorded it um like the day before right and that's like abbott um utilizing COVID 19 in particular uh, to sort of protect himself um from folks so like what would his ability like would abbott be able to go toe to toe with the donald trump i don't think so um for a lot of you know just purely performative reasons but no i mean abbott's a very effective and dangerous republican um and regardless if he has presidential ambitions or not he's done a hell of a lot of damage to people in this state um well, folks, let's see. I mean, uh, I, I don't see any more questions. I could maybe take one or two more. Um, maybe while people are, uh, it, it takes them a second to load up. So maybe while, if anyone had any other questions um, on any topic, if you want to talk about something else, I'd be happy to maybe take a couple um, before uh, we get to those. Um, I want to do this as a quick shout out. Uh, this is Greg Kassar, um, who's one of the reps from my area. <clears throat> who was a DSA member uh, no longer, but has been doing some pretty good work um, in, in some avenues. Obviously his, his stuff when it comes to Israel-Palestine is, is pretty frustrating, um, but he's been he's been advocating a lot for Cuban people. And he does a framing here that I would disagree with about Cuba's government having responsibility, um, you know, in, in some level for some of the, the pain that people are going through. But I think this is still very important for somebody to be saying um, in the United States Congress, trying to put pressure on biden and the, the the democrats to lift this absolutely inhumane blockade on the cuban people i want to talk about cuba the embargo farmers food and immigration 
Uh, Cuba is facing its worst economic crisis in decades, resulting in dire shortages of essential goods like food, medicine, and sanitary products. These conditions have caused a record number of Cubans to flee out of dire necessity. The Cuban government bears responsibility, but we also know the crisis has been made worse by U.S. sanctions and the embargo against Cuba, which for 60 years has crippled trade and financial transactions between our two countries that are so close geographically. And in those 60 years, these sanctions and the embargo have not resulted in the sweeping shift towards democracy in Cuba that we would like to see. But current economic conditions have compelled folks to flee. And as we know folks fearmonger about migrants at the border, we know that more often than not, migrants are seeking refuge out of necessity and we should be revisiting our policies that push people out of their home countries when they want to. I mean, I just think that that point is is such a basic one, but it's one that is so absent um, from any kind of conversations on on migration and the American role um, in creating a lot of devastation around the globe. So very happy to see Greg, um, you know, making that point out there um, in Congress. And, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we can end this, this blockade. I'm hoping in the next month or so we might have Amina, um, back on the program, who was just part of a great labor delegation, uh, to Cuba, uh, where I believe Chris Small is amongst other people, um, uh, you know, we're in attendance. Um, so hopefully she'll be on soon to talk more about this. Um, but you know, it's, it's something that I think, you know, with the, with whatever di disagreements we may have um, with the Greg, I think it's it's really great to have somebody in office right now saying those kind of things and starting to put the pressure on the Democratic Party and and the government in general to end the blockade. Um, it's it's gone on way too long. It's extremely damaging and it's horrible to think that people are sort of being denied um, important medicines um, and and basic um, necessities to sustain life. Um, but let's see, we got a couple of questions um, I'll try to take and then we can, um, and then I might roll. But um, Margos uh, says, uh, really think the uh, the left in general needs to build out DSA in order to defeat Republicans and take back the Democratic Party from corporate Democrats and focus on winning the South. Um, well, I think totally we should be focusing on, on building power everywhere. And I think that the South um, is oftentimes written off as a place where you can't be doing progressive pro-worker uh, politics. I actually think that it's very fertile for that. And I think, you know, um, not just because I, that's where I'm from and where I live, but 100%. Um, you know, I think that even more important than dealing with the Democratic Party is actually building some strong, cohesive unit and movement um, that can, you know, operate on its own two feet, maybe running up people in the Democratic Party. Um, I'd like to get somebody on to talk a little bit more about Nevada, because I don't think people are as familiar with this, this story there, because, um, you know, they were able to um, win a, over the, the state Democratic Party to people who were DSA members and were Bernie folk. Um, but, you know, one through mismanagement and two, because the, the National Democratic Party and a lot of the Democratic institutions effectively just didn't respect the, the vote there. And we're running parallel campaigns, running campaigns outside of the more progressive um, state party um, that, you know, it's been an uphill fight that's been pretty damaging. Um, and I don't want to say that that strategy is foreclosed, but I'd like to get somebody who has a better understanding of Nevada than I do um, to maybe talk about what that process was like, because it was like a few years um, that they were in, in, in power. Um, and, uh, you know, there's been there's been some issues there. Um, Lenny Powers, um, um, Dozer fan, and I agree with Dozer 100 percent here, says people like Stephen and Greg give me hope for Texas and push me not to give up on the state. I, I totally agree with that. And I mean, like, there's so much, I mean, there's a lot to fight for here. There's a lot of like incredible things that are happening. And like, you know, I think when you see things like the, the, the fact that our government doesn't reflect Texas people, what Texans people, I mean, like you look at things like abortion, like you look at all of the things that <clears throat> the Texas government does and you look at public polling on it. I mean, there's a wild, gulf between what gets done in the legislature here and what regular normal Texans think. There are certainly right-wing folks, as we were talking about with Steve in here, um, but th they have way too, th their influence is outsized to their 
makeup of the population here. So, no, I mean, I, I totally agree. It's an uphill fight. It's really difficult. Um, and, and it's tough cause you have to fight on multiple fronts here. Um, but yeah, no, you should never give up. It's uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things to be hopeful for here. Um, Lenny powers wants to ask me, David, do you agree with Francis Fukuyama's end of history take? Um, I mean, uh, I mean, Fukuyama isn't even a Fukuyamian, um, anymore. Um, you know, Fukuyama's argument was that post cold war, um, the great fight, ideological fight between capitalism and communism was over and we were entering into a period of uh, what they call, what he called the end of history, right? Um, and the argument was not that like there wouldn't be politics, but that like the great questions on, on in, in like society had been settled to a certain extent. So there's still going to be eruptions. There's still going to be fights. There's still going to be politics, vicious at times. Um, but the idea that it's like kind of like liberal democratic capitalism was the system and the way that the world was going. Um, you know, I mean, that gets interrupted pretty quickly um, at the end of the triumphant 90s uh, with the, um, you know, neoconservative movement and the invasion of Iraq. Um, it gets blown wide open um, during the financial crisis and then the rise of populism. And we're going to have Alex Hokely on the show um, soon. Um, who wrote an excellent book that you should read if you're interested in this Lenny um, called The End of the End of History, um, which is sort of talking about, um, you know, this, this I don't know, not to sound too fancy academic or anything, but this reemergence of, 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 of history that, you know, this, uh, that this idea that things had been settled um, is, uh, you know, um, well, you know, wrong. Um, and I, I know that uh, Bessner and I've been meaning to read it. Bessner just had a long take on Fukuyama, which I'd be interested to read um, as as well. But I mean, no, I mean, like, I don't agree with uh, Fukuyama's end of history take. Uh, I think that, you know, it's I think that the, the thing about saying anything about Fukuyama's end of history take is that um, I think it's like I don't agree with it, but it's one of those things where at this point it, that that thesis um, has been very much like disproven by history over the past few decades that sometimes people um, might not want to interact with that text. And I think it's something that's definitely worth reading, um, if nothing else, as like an ideological artifact, um, because it's a very interesting text. Um, and like, you know, we do, I mean, think about it like, OK, so let's say that the argument, right, that that like, OK, there's no more capitalism versus communism as like the grand struggle of of history well think about the you know one thing that i think is interesting um about our current moment is that um without that great you know this these this grand narrative of like capitalism versus communism um you know that dominated so much of the 20th century with that going away right with there basically being a hegemonic force in power um opposition to that hegemony opposition to like a capital system that is continuing to destroy the planet destroying the lives of working people uh, fueling conflict all across the globe without that kind of like a like a strong alternative right something that was sort of coherent um you know a lot of the weird parts of of global politics from like the rise of the far right um, I think our, our, our consequences with the fact that like there hasn't been an answer. So like, you know, in, in a lot of ways, Fukuyama's argument is incorrect in the sense of like, oh, history is over. Um, but one of the challenges that is sort of posed by like that end of history thesis is that like, well, if there's no other game in town, what comes after? What comes next? Um, and there has been a, a movement that's been articulated, right? Um, you know, you look at a lot of the left populist movements, um, you know, Bernie Sanders, Corbyn, uh, Podemos, Syriza, et cetera. Um, you know, they were they were very important. They recalibrated a lot of people. Um, but they also all lost at the end. Um, they weren't able to, they weren't able to undo, for example, the class demobilization that you've seen in America or the class demobilization that you've seen in the UK or in Spain, um, or in, or in France. And, you know, France might be one of the unique ones where there is this kind of stronger resistance movement, but the question would be, how can that sort of deliver itself, um, 
you know, into, into politics and we'll see what happens, you know, as these protests and, and social movements, you know, continue to fight back against Macron. Um, but no, there's like a, you know, I mean, we did a, a, a opening segment on the show a couple weeks back. Um, you can look up the video. It's called the morbid symptoms of American politics, I think. And it is just this like sense that like people, I think globally, and just maybe focusing on the U S for a second, all sort of are recognizing that like, this isn't working. Um, but where to go? And that creates a lot of weird, morbid uh, symptoms in politics from things like, you know, falling out of politics to embracing of the far right. Um, you know, like a, a lot of the the weird and dangerous things that we're seeing right now, I think, do come out of like a, a lack of mobilization and a lack of an answer to what can come after. So, you know, if Fukuyama is wrong, the ghost of Fukuyama is still with us <laughs> is, is maybe a way to think about that. Um, Nexus of Midnight says, are you guys going to cover the recent elections in Chile um, with the far right being on the Constitution Rewrite Committee? I would like to. Um, you know, we've talked about this a lot. I mean, um, I, I, if I can find a good guest, I would love to be able to, to do that. I mean, I'll just tell you my top line thoughts on this is that, you know, the, the failure with that, the, the most uh, recent constitutional vote and that writing of that constitution, I think is something that's going to haunt the left for a long time you know that the constitution that was put out um was all over the place it was alienating and confusing to a lot of people um, a lot of people have been sort of making you know instead of sort of looking at maybe some of the um organizational problems of the left in chile um you know basically did the classic we're going to blame the voters the voters are too stupid and too racist and too sexist or whatever i'm mean, certainly some people are but that's not that can't be your answer for why you you lose something like that um and a lot of those were self-inflicted wounds um you know the constitution was massive it was complicated people didn't get it um and you know the idea that the constitution sort of has to be there to addressed every like particular social struggle i think worried a lot of people um and it, it seemed um it also didn't seem reflective of the demand that folks were making when they wanted to end the pinochet uh, constitution in, in in chile and like it's scary because these kind of things you know they embolden the right and like the real worry is like man you could get a worse constitution than than the pinochet one i mean could you can you imagine um no, I would love to have somebody on. If you have any suggestions on guests, we would uh, I'd be very happy to hear it. <laughs> How's Ted Cruz? How can Ted Cruz still be a senator from Texas when he's universally hated? That's my question. I mean, you know, he's hated by lots of us, but um, you know, there's a lot of voters here who do like Republicans. Um, and you know, Beto probably was the, the 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 opportunity, and it came closer than a lot of people thought. I think he, I think Cruz is somebody who is open. We'll see how this next uh, cycle goes for for Ted Cruz. I, it will be interesting to see um, if uh, if the Democratic candidate coming up into this cycle is going to be able to 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 feed off of Ted Cruz's unpopularity. I don't know. Um, I think sometimes it can be easy to forget though like ted cruz presents himself as like the true conservative and there are people who are very mobilized and motivated by that and i think the bigger question neat has to be like running a negative campaign against cruz i think can maybe get you close um to the finish line but you're also going to have to give people something that's going to make them want to show up and you know the, the <clears throat> non-voters in texas are a major force um in the sense that like a lot of people just still don't vote and like if you want to change the state you're gonna to have to be able to mobilize those people and uh we'll have to see i don't know if hate of ted cruz is gonna be enough um On, on Chile, uh, Nexus of Midnight says, after all, Cass' father, the guy leading the far right, he, he his father was an officer in the Nazi military. Making him a new anything would be horrible. Yeah, it's, it's frightening. I would love, yeah, I would love, to, if anyone has any good suggestions and guests for that, I'd love to do something on, on this. It's, it's unfortunate, though. 
Um, well, folks, so next week uh, we're going to have on um, Vivek Chibber, somebody whose work I respect tremendously. His new book, The Class Matrix, is definitely worth picking up and reading. Uh, I'm really looking forward to talking to him. And in the post game next week, we're going to have Matt Huber on. Um, we always love chatting with Matt Huber about climate change and class politics and some ways to get ourselves out of the hole um, that we're in. Uh, thanks so much to Stephen for coming on the show today. For patrons, patreon.com slash left reckoning. I think we're going to do part two of our 18th Brumar and our Marx reading series. Um, so keep your eye out for that. And um, don't forget, if you missed it, our conversation with Harvey K for patrons. Um, in the post game this week was a hell of a lot of fun uh we covered a lot of different stuff it's always really fun being able to hang out um with harvey on the uh you know more casual post gamey side of the show so if you missed it uh listen to it and if you don't have access sign up at patreon.com slash left reckoning everybody uh, take care have a good weekend we'll be back this sunday with the bonus episode for patrons and uh, see the rest of y'all on tuesday take care